Okay, so. Okay, so where we're at is we've got our basic diagram for our project. So our project, we start out with our AISO, <coughs> then he feeds all the other blocks, he's coming from the switch. Then we have our debounce, Pong Chu. Then we have our little pulse maker. Then we have our counter and our seven seg display. So the difference between 460 and 360 is 360, we've got a second debound. 460, we're going to replace the counter with the processor, assuming I get it working. Worse, can work. So now that my two friends have dropped out of the class, anybody else have a Nexus 4? Okay, one guy. So maybe if, if I crash, I'll have to loan you a board. But we'll see. I don't think I'm going to crash. But we'll see. So what I want to talk about is how do we verify it? So most of you guys in 460 were in 360. So the very best way is to employ a divide and conquer methodology. So if you write the whole thing out, it becomes very cumbersome to then come back and try and figure out what's working or not. And each of the major functional blocks, my recommendation is that you create a test bench. And the test bench format we've seen has a device under test, And then the test bench is in the form of a wrapper. All of the inputs are stimulated by the test bench. And we saw last semester there's more than one way to verify the results. And for those of you that weren't in 360, uh, we verified the behavior of our test benches by looking at the waveforms. Then we also wrote self-checking test benches where the test bench itself anticipated what the output should be and checked it that way. So this is the basic template that we want to follow. So my recommendation is that we take each of these and so the AISO could be the first and then we create a test bench around it. Now what I wanted to do tonight is just to walk through a couple of these and we can just see how it would go. So for my test bench I would say module AISO underscore TB. Now my methodology that, oh I moved it. My methodology is one test bench per module. The name of the test bench is always the name of the module with the underscore TB. So that when you have your directory, you have the multiple files in there, you immediately know which file is the test bench, which file is the design under test. So AISO should be in a file named AISO.V. The TB would be AISO underscore TB dot V. Along with this also, when we create our design, the resolution of each block is up to the author. But 
what I expect is that one module per file. Verilog allows you to create a single file and have multiple modules. That would work okay, except when it comes to our file management. Now we no longer have a file name that corresponds to the module that we're creating. So from a management perspective, it's easier. With the test bench, there's no port list. Because with respect to this little test, the test bench is the world. Everything is happening inside the test bench, so there's no inputs or outputs to the test bench. Then, and I gotta help myself, so on the AISO are ports, we have, uh, let's call it reset, clock, and uh, you could choose your own name, I'm just going to choose a name, reset S for synchronized reset, which is the purpose of this design. And I don't think there's any other ports to the AISO, right? Okay, so what we would have here we would declare a register reset and that represents the reset from the switch and that's our asynchronous in. We have to have a register for the clock and then we say, let's say a wire for reset S. And that's the reset out. And that's our <laughs> synchronous out. <clears throat> so in this case, then, we would instantiate AISO. Uh, it's common to use the module name as the instance name. Where it comes handy is when you're looking at the tool, if you just call it dot one, dot two, dot three, sometimes it's not so intuitive. Where you may need to do that is if in your design, you have multiple instantiations of the same module. So then by definition, each instance has to have a unique instance name. So we're instantiating module AISO, call it AISO. To port reset, we're going to connect our reset to port clock. We connect our clock and to the reset synchronized, we'll connect our reset synchronized. <coughs> Now, I know this is a repeat for some of you from 360, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. When you instantiate, so this is called instantiating the device under test, or I'm instantiating a module within this module. When you instantiate it in Verilog, there's a couple styles that are acceptable. The style I expect is as I've shown here, where it's called explicit <coughs> mapping. It's also called named mapping. And that means to read it, to port reset, I connect reset. To port clock, I connect clock. To port reset S, I connect reset S. The alternative to this is to just go reset clock reset s the order in the implicit mapping or <clears throat> positional mapping is according to the way the AISO module was defined this is bad practice I've talked about in the past we're working at Western Digital 
They had one module that had over 130 ports, and some young engineer had gone in to edit the file and transposed two of them. All of a sudden, the design stopped working, and it took us a long time to figure out what was going on because the error. I acknowledge that when it's just two or three ports, it does, doesn't really matter. But since I'm trying to teach a style, a methodology, I insist that we use the explicit mapping so there's no ambiguity. I know exactly what port I'm connecting to. Because of that, the sequence doesn't matter. So I could have put the reset S. The sequence I do it here doesn't matter because I've told it exactly which ports to connect to which signals. Now, the next is, whenever we have a clock, we must generate the clock. So for us, depending on our design, I'm assuming this is a Nexus 2. So I generate a clock that switches every 10 nanoseconds. The period, therefore, would be 20 nanoseconds, so that would be a 50 megahertz clock. If you have a Nexus 3, it's going to be pound 5 because you're running at 100 megahertz. You want to model the clock according to the way it is on your board. Now, we know at this point in time we haven't defined the clock, but we can come in to an initial block. And what we want to do, we want to assert reset, and we want to initialize the clock. Now, initializing the clock to a 1 means this, that the clock will start at a 1, go for 10 nanoseconds, then drop for 10, now the first edge of the clock will be a full period in. You could have started with the clock at zero. You would have just got your first active edge 10 nanoseconds soon. I like this. I like having a whole period. Why do I have to initialize the clock? There's no reference in time. And that's what gives it the reference. So if you have a positive clock and a negative clock, you're going to do two different tasks. OK, okay so why do I have to initial, why do I have to sign one to clock? What if I left this statement out? Would this work? It's ambiguous. No. Yes? Can you? Yes, you can. It'll, it'll stay X. Yeah. That's exactly right. So for me to get my clock behavior, I have to assign a 0 or a 1 to the clock so that when I toggle it, it switches. Now, does it matter that my always is before the initial? Hey, why not? You're right. Since it's before the initial, it won't matter because the always is a background function. So once it starts, it's going to start. And once you give clock a value, it's going to kick in. OK, almost. Not quite. <coughs> Anybody got it? OK, the simulator is responsible for causing the simulation to act like the hardware will behave. So in our simulation, we put time delays. And if you are able to, on the old Verilog XL, when we had cadence here, we could trace and see exactly how the, the simulator was parsing our code. You'll see he comes down. 
He sees the always pound 10, and what does he do? He schedules that to occur 10 time units later. But it's still time zero. So then he keeps looking for other things to do at time zero. So the initial block and the always block are parallel blocks, you could say. They're going to be evaluated in parallel. So the tool will come down here, oh, initial, begin, no delays, reset will be assigned at T0, clock will be assigned at T0. So now it won't be until 10 time units later when he switches clock, it happens. So what do we want to do now? So now we want to wait. And the purpose of this block is to synchronize the release of reset. So if we did it like this, so now if I waited 10, let's say 25 <clears throat> nanoseconds, I'm going to be right there, right? 10, 25. So I'm going to say pound 25 reset equals zero. So what I'm doing is turning off reset. Then I can say end, end module. Now when I run my simulation, it will be my responsibility to verify, because what will happen is reset, Starts off high, then he's going to go low right there. It'll be my responsibility then to verify that the reset synchronous stays active until just after a clock transition. So when I'm running my simulation on AISO, what am I looking for? I'm looking for my reset synchronous to be deasserted synchronous to the active edge of the clock. And that's it. Once you see that, you can consider yourself done. Any questions on AISO? Okay, now I probably won't go in such detail, but let's walk through them. So D bounce. Obviously, D bounce is a lot more complicated in its construction. But the behavior is fairly straightforward. So I'm going to have, let me call the input switch, my output debounce. When I build my test bench for the debounce, what do I need to look for? So what I want to do is, I know that the behavior should look something like this. Now, I'm not going to cause my simulation to bounce, but what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to set switch, then turn off switch. Now, this interval should be probably maybe 50 milliseconds. Your choice. 
It means the simulation has to run a little longer, but it's really fairly straightforward. So I'm going to set the switch, wait about 50 milliseconds, turn off the switch, and then really what do I need to do? I need to probably let it run. If I let it run for 40 milliseconds, I should be okay. What is the res result that I expect to see? I expect to see the debounce switch to a 1 between 20 and 30 milliseconds after the first transition. Our debounce circuit is a digital filter. It makes sure that the switch remains stable for a minimum of 20 milliseconds before it allows the output to switch. So I set it from a 0 to a 1. When I look at my simulation, within a 30 millisecond window, I expect to see the debounce output switch from a 0 to a 1. Then as I let it run a while, I turn it off. Same story here. When I turn off the switch, I expect there to be within a 20 to 30 millisecond window, I expect to see the output of the debounce drop. Now if you want to test your debounce, you could bounce and all you would do is be pushing the 20 milliseconds past that time you switch. So it's fairly straightforward to verify the behavior of your debounce circuit. Any questions on the debounce? Now, just for my dear friends, I'm going to keep going. So now the little old pulse maker. Which is really a pause edge detect is similar. The difference is once we get to our little old pulse maker, we're in a synchronous world. So now we're not worried about synchronizing signals. I want to do it. So what I need to do here simply in my test bench is I'll have an input, I'll have an output, And what I'll do is when I switch the input from a 0 to a 1, leave it for a while, I expect to see my output switch for one clock period only. Then when I turn off my input, I want to confirm that I don't generate any pulses after that as well. So how do I approach these, and let me be honest, a circuit as simple as the little old pulse maker, I may not write a test bench for. But if I did, it would be fairly simple to confirm the proper operation of the pulse maker circuit. So what do I need to do on the input? I need to switch from a 1, 0 to a 1, which will cause the little old pulse maker to generate the pulse. Then I want to go from 1 to 0 to make sure that that transition doesn't trigger a 
n. Pretty simple. Now our counter gets a little bit more exciting. Our counter has a reset, clock, up high, down low. We call this a pulse. And then we have our count. Is our count 16? It is, right? Yes. So let me just write it to be fair. So we'll say module counter underscore TV reg reset S, let me use commas, comma clock up high, down low, pulse. Wire, 15 to 0, count. It doesn't look well? You won't be able to see as well. Okay. Bring it to the middle. So I don't know if I need to go through it, so I'll keep talking. So what do we do next? So we initialize all of the inputs, the reset, the up high, down low. Then what you do is turn off reset, up high, down low, let's say it's a one to start, and you just generate five or six pulses on the pulse input. Each pulse should only be one clock wide. What would happen if the pulse is two clocks wide? Oh, double count? Yeah, you know, double count. Instead of counting just one, it would count two. So when you generate this, it should only be one clock wide. How do I do that? I can say always at pause edge of clock pulse equals one. Not always. At pause edge of clock. So I'm in an initial block here. At pause edge clock, pulse equals one. At pause edge clock, pulse equals zero. That will cause my simulation to create a one clock wide signal on pulse. So it's pretty simple to do that. Now, once you have the individual pieces that you verified, you could create a test bench from the top. Now, the difference would be You're now getting your seven segment out. But if you wanted to, you could first verify just taking the count out. And then you would verify that once you've stitched them together, everything works. How would I have to do that? All I have to do is turn off my reset and generate a transition on my debounce causes a pulse, and I would see my counter increment. If I wanted to, then I could switch the up high down load, do it again, and I see a decrement. That would tell me it's working. The seven segment display is a little bit more difficult in that 
it's not as intuitively obvious what those seven segments are telling you. But you can still look at it to make sure it works. So this was a simple discussion I wanted to have on verifying the individual pieces of our project. Any questions?